that far back in Microsoft. Um, and basically, I have been involved in taking mobile payment technologies. Um, and my name is Carl Weaver. In Chinese, it's Wei Car. Uh, I am bilingual in Mandarin, uh, and that augments my professional career, which is basically to take mobile technologies, both hard and software, and promote them, evangelize them, sell them, market them to the handset manufacturing ecosystem, which really started about year 2000, uh, primarily from Taiwan, around year 2000, with some handset vendors uh, taking win, calling themselves ODMs, morphing into OEMs. The first OEM was actually HTC. Um, and they started to supply um, for Microsoft and for some other uh, uh, OEMs around the world, around 99, year 2000. Uh, and in 2001, um, uh, I was involved with an antenna company. Sorry, 2002, I was involved in an antenna company that had the project for the first um, smartphone in North America on Microsoft's campus, working with a small UK company called Sendo. And Sendo had the IP, both hardware and software IP, for the first smartphone project that Microsoft, with their Windows, um, Microsoft Windows Phone, or Windows, um, what is it, Windows Phone, something like that, that they were working on. Um, eventually, what happened is, is I started doing public speaking, and uh, I was invited by Microsoft on their campus, their Chinook room building. I don't know if you're, how long you've been working at Microsoft, but they used to have four buildings um, off of 148th. That was their wireless or their mobile team. What, building 116, 17, 18, and 19. Do you remember that? That was a long time ago. Anyway, I gave my first presentation, invited by the Puget Sound Hansett Users Group um, to present on think, this thing called smartphones, because really Microsoft was pushing it very early on. Uh, the only other company that was really pushing that was BlackBerry in Canada, Nokia in, the, in, the, in Europe, and then Palm down in California. So these, these were really the early smartphone days. Um, I started delivering public speaking presentation on this because nobody knew about this technology. Um, fast forward to base, basically about 2008, and I was at a trade show in Vegas, a smartphone summit. I was presenting on mobile WiMAX smartphones. Uh, because there'd only been one, and HTC had designed it, and I was, I was giving feedback to HTC. I've been dealing with HTC for at least 10 years. I know the CEO, uh, the, the chairwoman as well, Chair Wong. She's a very rich and famous lady. Anyway, so the key point here is that I was presenting, uh, and I usually throw in a few words of Mandarin Chinese, because I'm, I speak, read, and write Mandarin Chinese. I know that's a very rare uh, kind of thing for somebody who's not Chinese, right? It's pretty rare. But this is my life and career. So I was there, and um, in the audience were some people from Gemalto. And I said, gelato? No, Gemalto. Uh, I said, isn't that an Italian ice cream? No, it's not. Gemalto is the digital leader in digital security. They make all the debit, all the credit cards, all the SIM cards, and even the NFC that's, uh, that's in the US passport, which we don't use. Um, don't ask me why. Talk to Homeland Security. Anyway, the bottom line is fast forward. They, um, asked me to take on a special project and to, they uh, employed me to go work in Beijing, China. A French company hires an American from Seattle to go to Beijing. Hmm. Some things just did not compute. However, I said to myself, okay, this is an interesting new challenge because I've been pitching to the handset manufacturing ecosystem. Uh, Jamalto said to me that we know the smart card industry, we know SIM cards, we know operators very well. Thank you, Carl. But we don't know the handset manufacturers. And they're primarily in Taiwan and China, South Korea to a lesser extent. And almost none were left in Japan at that time. They'd all ODM'd to the Taiwanese handset manufacturers. I went to Beijing in 2008. I'd only seen NFC technology once in 2007 in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong has been a leader in contactless smart card uh, technologies. They've actually been, actually was the first place in the world to launch contactless publicly and commercially. People don't know that. It wasn't Japan. It was Hong Kong. Um, anyway, the bottom line here is um, they hired me to promote these SIM embedded technologies, this near field communications technology. I'd only seen it once in 2007 in Hong Kong where this unattractive, unsexy Nokia smartphone uh, with Nokia people and Visa people were walking around the show saying, hey, look at my handset. 
they were just tapping, uh, they were tapping a reader and say, isn't that cool? I said, yeah, I didn't really understand the technology, just to be very honest. 2008, I was at a trade show, uh, I think it was April, March or April. They needed me. I took the gig. I went to Beijing, China, first day in the office. I'm on the phone, and I'm speaking Mandarin, and, <laughs> and my colleagues are going, who the hell is this guy? So can, you might want to cut that out. Who is this guy? He's not French. He doesn't take like two-hour coffee breaks. Any French people here? Um, the French are hardworking people, and they're very wireless savvy. But basically, they, the, uh, the, the, my Chinese colleagues in Beijing were really stereotyping. They said, who is this guy? He's not French. He's picking up the phone. He's making conference. He's making, uh, uh, he's making, he's setting up meetings on his own. He, he doesn't need our help. W what planet is this guy from? So basically, day one, I basically said, I'm here specially to promote and evangelize this technology. At that time, Chinese people from China could not go to Taiwan, or they were just about ready to be able to be uh, admitted to go to Taiwan for seven days max as a tourist uh, with, a, with a tour group. That's the, that was the only way you could get to Taiwan for mainland Chinese people. Um, after I came on board a few months then, fortunately, they lifted that ban, and then my technical colleague could accompany me to Taiwan, usually on one-week trips, to evangelize. My first design in win with near-field communications technology was HTC, working with NXP. And uh, the second one in Taiwan was Acer. Uh, HTC took a lot of effort. I think it took me, uh, it took me going to their annual dinner, um, you know, once or twice, and then um, dealing with all these, tip, these departments in HTC. And eventually, eventually, they finally agreed in 2009 to start using the technology. And I, had, uh, had, I worked with NXP uh, on that as well to get them on board. And then around 2010, they came out with the first NFC handset for the Chinese market, working with China, China Merchants Bank. So let's back this whole thing up. Near Field Communications, NFC. For most of you, you don't use it, right? Well, did you know that NFC has three modes? We haven't really started this presentation, but I want to just show you. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is simply, I wrote a tag. This is the GSMA. I simply wrote a tag, and this tag says my name, says the company I work for, and my website. That's all that tags do. Tags are very simple, but it's a, it's a function of the read-write mode for near-field communications. So I spent those five years enabling two cutting-edge technologies in the handset manufacturing ecosystem, because if you want to scale so that Americans can use, this, use the technology, you have to go to China and Taiwan. If you want mobile devices with new embedded technologies, especially involving security, you have to go to Taiwan and China. Now, fast forward five years, India has three companies doing this, doing uh, manufacturing uh, of smartphones. The Koreans are still manufacturing, right? And then the Japanese are getting back into it a little bit. Uh, and of course, well, the Europeans are basically out of the ball game. In America, we don't manufacture cell phones in the country per se, although, micro, although Motorola has a manufacturing facility in Texas where they get the goods from, um, from um, Mexico. Anyway, uh, the bottom line here is I spent those five years. I came back in 2013, and I said, wow, OK, here I am, and all this action going on. EMV, EuroPay Visa MasterCard protocol. American banks are going to need to imp implement and adopt this technology. Fantastic. We have this company called ISIS. Well, what is that? Is that a cute Egyptian, Egyptian lady? No. This was uh, T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T launching mobile NFC proximity mobile payments. Um, and I predicted that they would launch soon. And uh, this lady here was, in, was, was speaking with me in November when I predicted they would launch soon. They, pre they launched the next day. They launched, however, nobody knew the technology. And that's where the problem is. This technology comes from the Germans, the Dutch, and the French. So Americans, uh, knowledge of NFC, very limited. Their knowledge of mobile payments, also very limited. And their knowledge of Europay Visa MasterCard, unless you're in the banking ecosystem, you don't know it if you're programmers here. So tonight's presentation, what we want to do is we want to get you programmers to evangelize developing things like mobile wallets, which don't require you to specify the proximity payment technology used on the wallet. You can use barcode. You can use uh, Bluetooth, although Bluetooth may not be for the proximity cash 
payment, but you can also use NFC. So I want you to come. I want you to um, think about developing these technologies. If you're here uh, to learn about these technologies and your and your programmers, you will learn lots of interesting things. So um, fast forward um, in the June time frame, uh, the May time frame, I went to. CARTS, which is the smart card industry's major show. They have one in France every year, the United States, and uh, Hong Kong every year. I heard this discussion from a company called Simply Tap, small company, and then they were backed up by AB Note, uh, an American company that makes smart cards, much like Jamalto, but a competitor to Jamalto. And I said, well, this is cool technology, because I've been evangelizing in this state for one year about near-field communications, because I saw that this industry, this technology, was um, not being uh, evangelized well, and ISIS simply didn't do a good job. They simply didn't do a good job of explaining to the average citizen what near field communications was, what mobile payments was. So I started to cooperate with Simply Tap, uh, and I connected with AB Note as well. And then I said to myself, wow. When I, when I understood finally what Apple's strategy and plan was, I knew that Apple was going to launch. I knew this last year um, because I gave a slide and I said Apple would launch. I, I was 65% sure, am I correct, that Apple would launch. They did launch. But they launched with something called an embedded secure element. Now, what Apple is doing is not that much different than what HCE does, except that the security is in the chip, whereas in HCE, the security uh, is in the open operating system. Therein lies the problem with security, uh, and that's what we'll discuss tonight. We'll, we'll also t touch a little bit about something called the TEE, because I also promoted that technology, the Trusted Execution Environment. Now, if you've never heard of this technology, trust me, it's going to play a role, because from what I understand, T-Mobile will be looking at adopting that. Can I say that? Is that? OK, good. So. Tonight, uh, which, which, where do you want me to stand? Over here or over here? I, oh, OK, right here is fine. All right, so tonight's presentation is called Host Card Emulation, Opening Up NFC Mobile Payments to the Cloud. I don't want you to feel that this is the only technology out there. In fact, my next slide will explain exactly. Um, this, OK. Ooh, looks like a cell phone. All right. So there are actually three camps here in North America for what we call proximity mobile payments. There's remote mobile payment where you get on your smartphone, you get onto a web browser, you find the website, you see the product that you like, you input your credit card, bingo, you bought the product from, let's say, Amazon.com. That's mobile payment, but that's remote, what we technically call remote mobile payment. That's not proximity mobile payment where you're at the poster, the point of sale device, and you use your smartphone to swipe an, an NFC or near field communications uh, enabled point of sale device at the retail merchant, at the restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. Even a mobile post, but not these square things. These things are a joke, in fact. So, uh, I'm, here to debunk, I'm here to debunk these things, because these things have absolutely little security. See these things here? Don't waste your time. All right, what do we have? We have three routes to the holy grail of contactless mobile NFC payments. You don't need this if you have NFC in your smartphone already. Am I right? What do you think? What, what is your name? Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. You're in, you're in finance. Yes. And you're, you went to the, I, I, I taught globalization at Seattle University. You're a graduate. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Welcome. Welcome tonight. We have three different camps. We have the HC host card emulation camp where Google has worked with a company. They bought the technology from Simply Tap. Google uses Android operating system right now. The latest version is 4.4 Android operating system. On the other side, we have the fantastic Apple Pay with Passbook. Passbook is the wallet they use. The wallet they use could come from Simply Tap if you want to develop, or it could come from, Apple, from, um, from Google's Google Wallet. But from Apple, it's only Apple Pass. That's uh, Passbook. That's what they'll use. From Google, you can use many different wallets. 
Now, on the other side, we have the company formerly known as ISIS. We won't use that term anymore. Softcard, okay? We have Softcard. Softcard basically is using um, the SWP. That stands for near. That stands for single wire protocol. The single wire protocol SIM card from Jamalto and other vendors. That's what Softcard uses. Softcard was originally called ISIS, which was a joint venture between T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon. Sprint was also a member, but they dropped out to do what? Ooh, they're doing this. They're doing host card emulation. So we have three camps here. We have the embedded secure element, which is coming from Apple Pay. It's a near-field communications chip where something called the secure element is embedded. So the operators have no control. On this side, we have the secure element embedded into a SIM card. It's embedded into a standard SIM card, and NFC functionality is added to that as well. And so you go to the store. You say, I want a mobile payment handset. Oh, great. Here are the ones we support. Here's your, your NFC SIM card. You put it in. You provision the wallet. Provision your credentials. Provision your credit card details. Bingo. Voila. It's not that simple. Um, Ms. Shrinhua Chang will tell you it's not that simple. But basically speaking, that's how it's supposed to work. On the other side, you have to develop um, with the banks the Google KitKat HCE wallet, or you can use um, Google's wallet. They have a wallet, but it's not compatible everywhere. And I'll show you why it's not. Let me move on. What is a smart card? It's really, really important to understand what a smart card is. I usually bring something showing a smart card. Um, but I, did, I forgot to bring it. But see this? This is a chip and pin or chip and signature credit card. Could be a debit card. It could be a loyalty card. It could be a transit card. It stores important details with inside this smart card and it has a loop antenna with an NFC chip, possibly an NFC chip on the other side. This one doesn't have NFC. Why not, I wonder? Well, because it costs more money. But this is what we call a chip and pin, or in this case, chip and signature. Get used to this, because by October of 2015, most retail shops will migrate over to using this technology. Now, you might be getting these cards now. Demand that your credit card company give you one. And if they say, no, we haven't done it, tell them exactly what you heard tonight. By October, they must migrate over. Otherwise, the risk goes to the merchant and to you. Hell, hello, Houston. We really have a problem there. So um, demand that your credit card uh, uh, facilitator or your bank really gets up to the ballgame because it's going to be a crime. And, and Mr. Obama just designated as a national um, requirement that these chip and pin or chip and signature cards must come into play very, very soon. So thank you, President Obama, for doing that. I think he's, I think he's done that, which is going to help the entire ecosystem. So what we have are smart card technologies. Smart card can be contact, like I have with my credit card, which means I can't swipe a wireless point of sale device, or it could be contactless, and I can. And in China, most banks use China Union Pay, but the, you can take the credit card and just tap or swipe. You don't really have to tap it. You have to be within four centimeters in order for the technology to work. So that's what they're doing. And with contact, which is what I have right here, it uses the ISO 7816 protocol. That's the technology that it uses. But if it's contactless, it'll, it'll use uh, the 13, the ISO 14443 protocol. Um, because that's what you use for any point of sale device or any, any contactless situation. Contactless is simply two chips, master and slave, or slave and master, however you set it up. That's what, that's what this technology is from a very basic level. Now, they all work with only one frequency, 13.56 megahertz frequency. And I've heard people say, oh, it's RFID. Absolutely not. NFC is kind of like a kissing cousin to RFID, but it is not the same thing. Because RFID works in multiple frequencies, and it's used mostly for merchandising. It also has much different ranges. You can, you can spec it uh, a few feet. NFC is four centimeters. That is the spec from the NFC forum. So the other side here is what we call a secure element. 
Think of a secure element as simply a storage facility, a tamper-resistant so storage facility where nobody can get at it. It's also, uh, it's an operating system, it's a native operating system, and, uh, well, it's, it's a secure element around an operating system, but it's a storage facility that you can't get to. The only ones that can get to it are the ones who provision the SIM cards. Those are the ones who can get to this technology, which means who? Mostly MNOs and operators. They're the ones who can get to this technology. And they provision each handset, and they provision, for example, T-Mobile provisions T-Mobile's um, technology into that secure element for mobile payment and other things, not just payment credentials go inside the secure element. So that's what we have. And there are three form factors. We have micro SD form factor. You can put the secure element, secure element in micro SD. You can put it in the SIM card. Or, by the way, we call that USIM for 3G. And for 4G, we call that UICC, International uh, Integrated Circuit Card. I don't know why they don't call it USIM for 4G, but they don't call it USIM for 4G. And then embedded, like, Mike, like Apple has done, embedded into the NFC chip. This is an NFC chip, um, or it could be an NFC chip with the secure element embedded, embedded with embedded software. So that's, those are the three normal ways you find the secure element inside of your mobile payment smartphone. Now, just very simply, how it works is the consumer accesses a wallet. Any wallet that you want to determine to use, you access the wallet. They take the wallet and it uses the technology at the point of sale. You're going to see um, logos that show NFC or what looks like a little chip with a person's hand. That's NFC. The NFC interacts. There's an antenna inside that's connected to the controller chip, okay, which is up there, has an antenna, it radiates a signal. It, it could be down here, it could be up there. It just depends on how you develop the handset. There's a secure element, in this case, a SIM card, a micro SD, or embedded. It's a secure element um, embedded into some kind of hardware. There's also the application, we call it the mobile applications processor chip or your baseband chip. So I know this is a bit technical, but Trust me, it gets more interesting after this. In the handset, you have a controller chip, a mobile wallet. If you don't have a mobile wallet, how are you going to make a mobile payment? You need the mobile wallet, to, it, which is the UI to interface with the applications that you're going to use to pay for things. Um, there, there, there are certain protocols. There's a smart operating system within uh, the chip. Uh, and then there's a secure element operating system. So, and basically, things get stored and compartmentalized. Have you ever heard the term compartmentation? Um, now, contactless NFC, near field communication, it's a wireless protocol. It's a wireless RF technology. It's similar to, um, it's a YPAN almost. It's almost like a personal wide area network. So it is similar to Bluetooth. It is similar to Bluetooth, um, but it's not Bluetooth. Um, these are the protocols normally used. And the NFC protocol is not just one thing. It's a com combination of things, starting from the history of the technology. It's a combination of different protocols all within inside the spec. All right? um, and it helps. The, and the secure element is also part of this to help store the payment credentials. It's used with a wallet, Google Wallet, ISIS Wallet, et cetera, et cetera. The NFC forum, these are the guys who set the specs. What's really cool is I showed you this application before where you touch. Oh, it's already on. All I did is enable what we call read-write mode. The device can read or write the NFC form supported tag. It's simply a tag inside this badge. That's all it is. It's very simple. You can develop it. Um, uh, on, a, on a tag that you can use inside your car to turn on things in your car, the radio, in, on, automatically. Or you can have, if you have a Bluetooth handset, you can stream. You can have the, the Bluetooth um, driver stream immediately to the radio and bypass the use of uh, discovery and pairing with Bluetooth. It's messy. It can be very messy. All right. You have read-write mode. 
You also have peer-to-peer -peer mode, and that's very simple. I take two NFC-enabled smartphones, and I can touch them. And I can transfer all kinds of things. I can transfer pictures. Video will be very tough. It, the protocol doesn't allow for uh, transferring large video. But you can transfer, uh, you can transfer, let's say, pictures. But another interesting thing you can do is go to an ATM. And in Hong Kong, Fest, uh, in Hong Kong, you know, Jetco in Hong Kong, they're developing NFC into their ATMs because in Hong and people, people in Hong Kong and people in Asia. Uh, they like to use their credit card, but they also use a lot of cash. And they're going to these ATMs, and there are more ATMs in, in, the, in, in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan than any place else in the world. They're, it's ATM heaven. So they want to be able to go to the ATM and quickly withdraw cash from their smartphone. That technology is always, also being built in. And they will use something called peer-to-peer -peer mode in order to enable that. The third one is card emulation. That's simply, that's what we're talking about tonight. That's simply, again, where you take your smartphone, um, you take your smart card, and you, it, it emulates. This function on your smartphone emulates this. That's as simple as that. That's what it does. All right, good. We're getting past the technical stuff. OK, graphics. Um, so what is host card emulation? It is enabled by Google in their KitKat operating system. It's there now. It has been there since last November. But the uptake has been a bit slow in the beginning because people were concerned about the security. I'll talk about that. It allows cards to be issued from the cloud. So you're not having to worry about an MNO providing the credentials in the SIM card to provision. Every SIM card needs to be provisioned, and mobile payment handsets absolutely need to be provisioned with the credit details and the account details of the credit card holder. So instead of doing that with an MNO's trusted service manager, that's the third party platform that provisions the mobile payment for your SIM card in the mobile payment network. Okay, so instead of the TSM or the trusted service manager doing that, they now have um, TSMs that handle it in the cloud. So instead of doing it in the network, they do it in the cloud. It basically says you don't have to deal with an operator. You're bypassing the need to deal with an operator. Many of you who are in security, you're not going to want to use this technology because there are probably still some issues that you have with security. I am not coming here tonight to tell you that the company formerly known as ISIS or SoftCard approach is wrong. Absolutely not. It is right. It just requires the highest level of security, and not everybody's going to want that, and not everybody needs that. What I'm actually telling you tonight is the future of the smartphone industry for mobile payments is a hybrid smartphone using this um, NFC from either the SIM card or embedded like Microsoft, uh, like um, Apple is doing, or host card emulation, all in the same handset. Right now, HC is only found in Android smartphones, and BlackBerry has something called virtual target emulation. Actually, BlackBerry came up with something very similar in 2007, uh, implemented actually on this phone if you, if you didn't buy it in the United States. If you bought your BlackBerry uh, phone, uh, this is the BlackBerry Bold 9900, this phone actually could support uh, um, a virtual target emulation, which is very similar to host card emulation. All right. So going forward, HCE gives banks the freedom to deploy mobile payment systems everywhere because it's using the cloud. However, when it comes from the cloud, if you think the cloud is secure, I'm not 100% sure the cloud is secure. But if you think the cloud is secure, well, the problem is when they download it as tokens, we'll talk about that in a minute, when they download the payment credential as a token inside the smartphone, it's in the open operating system, and hackers can get to that. However, Apple has provisioned it securely with inside a chip. The proponents for host card emulation have put it in the open operating system. That's the only difference between how the tokenization is working between host card emulation and Apple Pay. That's the only difference. That's the major difference. Otherwise, it is the same kind of technology. Um, it's very simple of how it works. Here's your point of sale device. OK, I'm sorry, let's, let's take this example first. Here's your point of sale device. That's your CPU or your mobile apps processor chip. That's your NFC controller. 
That's the SIM card. Instead of it, instead of you tapping your handset with the controller in the handset to bring it to the SIM, in this case, you're bringing it directly to the CPU, which goes directly into the cloud. If that makes any sense. That's, that's kind of a simple way to explain it. This is the protocol stack used by Android's HCE. And it doesn't get any simpler than that. Using the cloud to bring the credentials down to the handset so that you can then take it at the point of sale, the post reader, and use the credentials, which have become a token. It's not a credit card anymore, which is very interesting new technology. They're using tokens. Actually, tokens are not new, but the implementation for Visa, MasterCard, American Express is new. So um, it basically, again, it allows you to emulate an NFC card and, takes, and, and to talk directly to the, to the reader, the NFC reader, without having to use a chip, a micro SD, or a SIM card. That, that's it. That's what it does in its simplest terms. Uh, some interesting graphics. Look at the countries that have adopted it. Do you realize how laggards we, how much of a, how much, how, how, how um, lethargic we are in this country? Canada, our neighbor to the north, is using this NFC and has been. And they've completely adopted and implemented this technology since I think around 2011 or 2012. I think BlackBerry helped, with, helped that. But look at the countries, Taiwan, which I was involved in, Hong Kong, which I was involved in. There's something interesting that you notice here. The countries that have implemented contactless, by the way, have not huge population, not huge, um, um, not necessarily huge populations, but they have huge consumer um, needs. None of these are third world countries, actually. Okay, none of these are third world countries. They're using the contactless because they can afford it. Number one, but number two, their banking ecosystems are adequate and sufficient. To, a, to use NFC technology at the point of sale. They don't know, these aren't third world, third world uh, or developing countries, are they? And quite honestly, Taiwan has 22 million, Hong Kong 8 million, Australia, what, 30 million? Canada, uh, 60 million? Poland, I don't even know. Singapore, what, five, 10 million, maybe? Um, New Zealand, I don't know, 5 million? Uh, these populations are not huge. So it's, it's an interesting thing that's going on. So, you see payments going on in these advanced places. Um, and host card emulation is going to work with the NFC crowd. They're going to need this technology. It essentially takes the need away from dealing with the operator and requires the banks to be more savvy with the use of this technology. That's what it does. Um, uh, very simply, how it works here, you have a payment app. Let's call that your wallet. You have the data physically hosted on the, on the hardware. This is with the traditional secure element architecture that T-Mobile uses and, um, well, not T-Mobile in general, but basically how, the, uh, how SoftCard uses the technology. You have data physically hosted in the hardware-based secure element. That's your SIM card. And then it touches the NFC controller, the contactless payment terminal. That's uh, another explanation of how it works. On this side here, we have the account data stored on a server in the cloud, hopefully secure. We have the payment app. You still need a wallet. You need a wallet with both applications. Then you have the NFC controller. You need, a, you need an NFC controller with both applications. And then you have the payment terminal, the post terminal. Again, you need the post terminal to make a proximity mobile payment using the communications. So they're, they're actually quite similar, except that the hosting is not done with the trusted service manager in the mobile network um, operator, the wireless operators uh, within their control, it's done in the cloud. But there are other cloud-based trusted service manager management organizations that are providing and provisioning your details in the cloud. It's just done in the cloud instead of done in a network, a controlled network in the operator's network. That's simple. This is not simple, but it does explain, here's your post here. Yeah, Jamal Toll has one of the most successful trusted service managers. But here it explains a bit how it works. It is complicated. You have an acquiring bank involved. You have an issuing, issuing bank involved. The, TSM, um, uh, the TSMs are sold to the operators and to the banks. You need both. Uh, it gets really complicated. 
And that's what slowed down mobile payments in North America and around the world because this is a complex business model. Uh, and essentially what HC tries to do is make it simple. Again, here is a, for you techie guys here, this explains how it works. You have a mobile app, your wallet, but the securement is where you keep the details. You go to the merchant, the point of sale, you make your mobile payment, it goes to the payment network up to the issuing bank. The issuing bank work, has their own TSM, service provider TSM, and there's an MSO, MNO TSM. The operator's trusted service manager, which is a payment platform, and then the bank's TSM, payment platform. It's damn complicated. It certainly is, all right? So that um, has lots of people confused. How am I going to implement my business model? I don't even understand this. This makes it much simpler. The issuing bank takes the details, provisions it in the cloud, sends it back down to a mobile app, irrelevant of the secure element, but um, the secure element still has value, as I'll explain before. So it simply makes it simpler to do. This company called Simply Tap invented the technology and they put it on the Android. Uh, there's an Android um, users group or, thir or, or um, third party users group on Android. And uh, Simply Tap put it there in 2012, but very quickly, Google was having problems working with. ISIS at that time, there was still ISIS. Google had problems. Why? They had a mobile wallet. ISIS said, I'm not going to accept your mobile wallet. Not for the operators. Sorry, we're using the secure element in the SIM card. We don't want to put it in the, uh, in the chip. That's what Google was doing. They had a, their wallet application, and they were working with NXP, and it, they put the secure element in the chip with NXP, and they and they expected the operators to go along with that. Of course the operators are not going to go along with that. They had no control over the ecosystem. The operators rejected Google Wallet, and that's why it really, doesn't, it, it really hasn't become successful. Now, um, Simply Tap took the technology, they sold it to Google. Late last year or mid last year, they sold it to Google. Google implemented it on the KitKat operating system 4.4. So if you have an Android smartphone that's 4.4, you have this technology now, which means what? Which means if the handset maker has provisioned it with HCE to use with a certain wallet, bingo, you can use the technology right now. So you have to ask the handset vendor. Uh, and when you try to explain to them, you say, well, what wallets does your handset, your Android handset support? What wallet does it support? As, I'll, as, I'll, as I will explain, the wallet can work with many types of proximity payments, uh, payment technologies. Let's go on. Some of the major value of the secure element in the cloud are it's independent, and it, but it also gives you direct control. It's direct access to the secure element, short time frame. It's a trusted service manager is very complicated. Uh, Jamalto has actually led that in Asia and in Europe. Uh, they've, uh, they've implemented this. There's nothing wrong with the secure element. It's the sec most secure way to provision to secure your smartphone. And if it's stolen, you just call this tr trusted service manager up. I lost my phone. They can track it. They can lock it. They can do everything immediately uh, where you're not going to have a problem. So, there's, so the technology that exists now in North America is secure without a question. Uh, although there's no 100% security in anything in the world, OK? Easy integration with third parties. Ah, this is where it becomes interesting. So if you're Alipay, you can implement this technology. If you're Bank of America, you can implement this technology, and you don't need to worry about working with the operators. Ah, interesting. What if you're Walmart? Hmm, yes, 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 yes. You see where the interesting opportunities arise? Lower costs. Well, it might be a little bit lower costing. Who's to say? There's only been a few launches around the world of this technology, but I'll show you. So I'll show you one of them. Security risk and management improvements. Interoperability. These are some of the reasons why you use the technology. This gives you an explanation of how it works. There's an issuing bank involved, or um, uh, in this case, it could be, uh, there's an issuing bank involved. It could, be the, it could be the TSM. They provision the secure element in the cloud, or the credentials in the cloud, and it gets sent over the air to the wallet. 
and then to be used at the NFC point of sale here. Bell ID is one of the companies involved in this technology. They have their own, I call it a cloud TSM. They said, Carl, don't use that term. We don't like to use that term, but that's exactly what it is. It's a trusted service manager to provision your payment credentials here in the cloud. That's what it is. This kind of explains how it works. Bingo, the, the issuer sends the payment data into the cloud, comes back down to your handset, ready to touch the point of sale device. This is another explanation of how it works. And ah, look at that. I can have multiple issuers. Oh, yeah, for sending cloud data to my handset. Wow. Do you mean I can have more mobile wallets than one? Yes. Do you mean I can have more credit cards with more mobile wallets? Yes. There's no limit. There's no limit. Um, this is for you programmers. It explains a little bit about Simply Taps HC Pilot. You can get a free HC Pilot from Simply Tap, or you can pay for one. You'll get more service by paying for one. If you're really interested in this technology, you see me after the show, and I'll introduce you to, H to Simply Tap. Okay? Now, as I told you, there's a lot of mobile wallets. This is the most successful in the world, Starbucks. Does anybody here use the Starbucks wallet? And if you don't, shame on you if you go to Starbucks. Because the damn thing is so easy to use. It uses barcode. You pull it out. It's connected to your loyalty card. You can even top up in the air at your home at 12 p.m. at night. You don't have to go someplace to top up. It's all done over the air. You take your wallet, you touch a barcode reader at the point of sale in a Starbucks, bingo. I have now started to use that whenever I travel around the world because, well, at least, I'm sorry, in the United States, I use the barcode uh, and my loyalty card with Starbucks because, lo and behold, there's a Starbucks in almost every airport, in almost every store, on every corner of the world, just about. So Starbucks is an interesting application. Um, but these wallets can use many different types of technology. They can use HCE, no problem. They can use the cloud. They can use QR codes. They can use SMS, Bluetooth. They can use any kind of technology. It depends on how the, ma the wallet developer develops the type of technology. So handset vendors and wallet vendors actually need to cooperate in order for you consumers to use all of these technologies. And by the way, what if I want to use all these technologies together? Well, that's just the development of the wallet. These are some of the other wallets out there in the market. There are tons of wallets out there. We'll, 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 we'll move on. There are actually for, does anybody know what EMV means? EMV, EMV means EuroPay Visa MasterCard. When did, when's the first time you ever heard of this EMV? When is the first time you heard of this? How long have you been using EMV? How long, when is the first time you discovered this thing called EMV? Mm -hmm. So you really can't use it without, you can't use this technology. Um, you really cannot use a credit card without EMV in Europe. Is that basically it? That's correct. In uh, North America, you, you can, of course, and they haven't adapted it here or down in Mexico, but they've got to do it, as you were saying, before October next year. Right. As I understand, Mexico is trying to implement that. Canada has implemented that. Every place else in the world has implemented that as well. Uh, but in certain stages and steps. The U.S. needs to come up to speed. But when it comes to EMV, EMV is working on or has the contactless smart card protocol. They have it for mobile. They have it for contactless and, and contact. And they also are working on it for the cloud. See, so the organization that controls the whole payment ecosystem for the banking community is already working on the adoption of this technology. But the technology for EMV, for HCE, for EMV, but actually American Express, Visa, and MasterCard have standardized it already on their credit card platforms. It's already been standardized. Um, now, let's talk about tokens. A token is really interesting. It's like using, it's like, it's almost like going in, on the bus here and using your Orca card, right? It's almost like that, but it's not quite a token, isn't it? it it's, a, it's actually a transit pass. Ah, I have mine here somewhere. But basically, a token is useless, and actually a transit pass is useless to anybody except the user, because when you lose it, you know it. You call, you call Sound Transit, they're locked out. You can't use it anymore. If you lose it, you tell them, they will lock it out. You can't use it anymore. Okay. So a token is very much like that. A token defined, what is it? 
it's a process of replacing your card details with a unique string of characters. One time for Apple Pay, one time, unique string of characters. It's restricted in how it can be used to secure the token PAN means PIN uh, account number. And um, these secure token PANs can be assigned for use with a specific device, a merchant, or transaction type or channel. Apple Pay is using tokens for one specific application to store them in the secure element in the NFC controller chip on Apple iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Cloud digital assurance. It's basically making sure the cloud-based mobile payments, um, making secure the cloud-based mobile payments. That's what a PAN does. Because in HC technology, it's not going into the embedded securement like the Apple Pay. It's actually going into a, uh, an open operating system um, application. Uh, and hackers can get to it. It's a problem. Um, some people say, well, who cares if the hackers get to it? Because, well, actually, the hackers can't do anything with that number. It's one time. Well, what Apple has done is very smart. They've used biometrics in your thumb. Okay, connected with the wallet, connected with the post device, connected with the, the credential. So you just tap your, your finger to the point of sale device, and it authenticates, encrypts, authenticates, and bingo. It makes it so simple. Apple is a very smart company, and they're going to be the ones to uh, open up the floodgates for mobile payment. We in the payment industry have been talking about this for five, six years. We've been waiting for Apple for a long time. Apple is only going to implement technology when they feel that they're ready uh, and, and timing is critical. Their timing is excellent. Um, let's go further. Um, tokenization of EMV payments. As I said, EMV is working on the whole standardization for this technology in the cards, not just in the handsets. Oh, yes. You'll see EMV uh, and HCE technologies. Well, you'll see cloud-based credit cards. This is what Alipay has been trying to do in China. Of course, the banks in China are owned by the government. China Union Pay is looking at this technology as well. But, they're talk but now you can actually buy a credit card using cloud-based services from uh, Bell ID in Europe. Very interesting, right? Let me go on. Um, emerging tokenization for HC mobile payment smartphones. I think I've gotten the point across. You take your credit card details. Let me go back. If you look here, you simply take your card details and you scramble them so that nobody knows what it is and it's one time typically. And so what does it matter that a hacker gets hold of it? They can't do anything with it. Um, uh, but it is critical to encryptionate, or I'm not sure if that's the, the correct term, but to provide encryption and tokenization for your cloud services. It really is very, very important. This is one of the companies. It's a, U a European company. It's one of the companies that has implemented uh, the Spans B Spain's BBVA. They've implemented this technology. They've, they've actually launched it. But there's another US company called um, Sequence Software that, has, that is working with Sprint to launch, or they will launch, this same kind of HCE technology. So in the United States, actually, Sprint is very close to launching this. Sprint has been very quiet, right? They're close to launching this technology. Um, and there's a bank in Russia that has implemented this. Spain has implemented this. Um, I think this is working with um, um, Bell ID. I'm not 100% sure who's providing the services. But you can see it's already being adopted and implemented. Now, here is how tokens work with the Apple format. OK, let's go through it. You submit the iTunes account in token request. And these guys, they're not the only ones, but these guys provide the, the payment token, Visa, MasterCard, Amex. But they're not going to be the only ones, but you have to work through them. Banks, third party companies are going to develop token solutions. This is going to be a very big business in the world sometime in the near future. Because Apple's doing it, Android is doing it. Um, you send, you receive the token card data, and Apple sends it into the secure element into a chip. Program token when the card is tokenized. Bingo. Ready? 
No hacker can get to it. That's how they do it. On the other side here, Simply Tap provides a permanent secure element in the cloud, and they send the token down before or after, in between, when you need it, without much latency. They send it down from the cloud into the handset to be ready for you to tap the point of sale. That's, the, that's how the service, basically, that's what they're providing. They're providing the service. So it's connected with the wallet. It's connected with the accounts that you normally use. Um, this gives you another explanation. The, so, yeah, it's, it's really, I'm sorry, it's really difficult to read. But how it, happen, how it works is basically the, the, the post takes the pan, the token goes to the, the pan. It's, it's, I'm sorry, this is a very blurred slide, and I apologize for that. But I think you got the point. This is how the technology works. Tokens are valuable. Um, this is, uh, for you bankers here in the, in the ecosystem, banks will use HC. They're all talking about it in the banking community, how they can use the technology right now. And I just explain uh, that, again, there are three different specs, Visa, MasterCard, and EMB is working on it. Uh, but I also came up with a list of things for how you provision, the, the plus and the minus of provisioning, usability, security, uh, and the business model. Hey, if it works, it works. And the maturity. Of course, mobile payments from soft uh, card are very mature. This technology is not that mature. But it is very important, and it's coming very fast. Um, these are merchants that accept Apple Pay and those that do not. Now, it's, what's very interesting is, OK, so these guys all accept everything. But these guys in the middle are all accept, also accepting from something called MCX, Merchant Card Exchange. And you know this organization? That's where Target, Walmart, they're all using barcodes. Come on, this is old technology. I, I don't know why they think barcodes are a solution to NFC. They are not. Uh, but they're cheap, they're easy, they work. Starbucks is using it now in America, but not in the UK. In the UK, 550 stores are using NFC, point of sale devices. Anybody here from the UK? Um, Google Wallet is compatible with these vendors. PayPal with some of these vendors, and even Starbucks. But I think you could expect all these guys to migrate to using NFC, um, and probably working with Apple. I think working against Apple simply is not a, an intelligent strategy, uh, because this company doesn't do things uh, with a one-year um, business plan. I first found out about the first iPhone in the world in Taiwan in, in 2003 on Foxconn's fact, in Foxconn's offices, where they secretly showed me a project of a cell phone, round like this, no antenna, no keypad. That was back in 2003. So if you think Apple has short plans and strategies for the development of the technology, they may not be the sexiest when it comes out to implementing technology, but they certainly know how to make it user-friendly so that we can all use it. They're the ones who are going to make it user-friendly. Um, China, China's role in, um, in this is actually very, very important. As you might know, Alibaba is going to put an office here in Seattle, probably staffed with 100 engineers, mostly engineers focused on what? Cloud, because we are in Cloud Central. We have Azure from Microsoft. We have AWS from Amazon. Uh, I mean, everybody coming here wants to talk about the cloud. We should relabel Seattle as the cloud city, not the rainy city. <laughs> All right, so we have. I just want to explain a little bit about what's going on in China, because China is important and it's significant. All right? We have the state-owned enterprises, China Mobile, Unicom and Telecom, and Union Pay, which, by the way, has a huge subscriber base. And making Visa, MasterCard, and American Exp Express have many sleepless nights. Um, these are all state-owned enterprises in China. And I'm responsible for helping them implement near-field communications on all these handsets to the ecosystem. I did that for five years. Very happy to do that. Now, on the other side here, and, and they're using just like SoftCard, just like T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, they're using the most secure method for payments because the Chinese government is very concerned about hackers. Believe it or not, um, it's not just 
the, the Chinese aren't just hacking us. They are hacking us, but they're not the only ones hacking us. The Russians are hacking us, uh, and the NSA is hacking us. And everybody's hacking everybody else because there's no trust in the world. I'm sorry. You might want to cut that. Anyway, the, fact is, the facts are the facts. And I, I never sugarcoat any of my words. Never. All right. But now we see that's only 20% of the market in China. So the technology is all there, but these state-owned enterprises are too slow, too bureaucratic. Lo and, behold, lo and behold comes Jack Ma with his Alipay and his Alibaba Corporation, and they say, we want to do mobile payments. They started with sound wave technology. They tried to pitch that to the bank. The Beijing subway system didn't work. Then they tried to pitch barcodes, and they were using that for a little while. And the Chinese Union Pay said, no, no, barcodes are banned for payment. No, no, can't use those. You can see that these ISP turned financial service organizations in China, okay, and huge um, e-commerce giants, they want to jump into that ball game. That is all state-owned. These are all private, aggressive, ambitious corporations. We call it the BAT, Baidu, Alipay, or Alip Alipay, Alibaba, et cetera, et cetera, and Tencent. Your, your WeChat comes from Tencent. So these guys have 80% of the market. These guys have 20% of the market. None of it's bad. None of it's bad. Why? Because they're all implementing near-field communications. It's just the way that they're implementing it now. These guys will try to carve out their niche with the transportation sector, making their own mobile wallets, and somehow trying to maybe use HCE. Does that make sense? These guys will work with the GSMA, these guys here. They'll work with SoftCard, I hope eventually one day, it seems to make sense, for global interoperability between China and the United States. There's already global interoperability with this technology between, between Korea and Japan because of uh, the TSM from Jamalto. So that's why I say to you, the future is not HCE against the secure element uh, in the SIM card. No, 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 no. The future is a hybrid device where the handset bank maker says, hey, you, you worry about your politics. I want to sell handsets. That's what handset vendors only want to do. This basically frees up banks to use the technology and, of course, all the companies that normally want the security to use the technology via the operator. None of it's bad and none of it should be controversial. The problem is, is that we in the West um, and we here in North America don't understand these technologies. That was the purpose of me to try to describe this to you tonight because it's damn confusing. Um, but I'm here to evangelize this technology like I was in 2003 as the first public speaker on smartphones in North America. Uh, and so basically, I want to be the NFC rainmaker in Seattle to explain this technology to everyone. And I want people to know about host card emulation. Uh, and, and my viewpoint is a hybrid smartphone. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this parting thought. The hybrid smartphone is the only way to go for handset vendors because they want to work with banks. They want to work with MNOs. And by the way, anybody here work for Microsoft? Nobody. Come on. Nobody here for Microsoft. Microsoft has already implemented HCE as a standard for their Windows phone, but they haven't adopted it yet in They've already come out with the spec. BlackBerry has it. Android has it. Who's the next logical choice, possibly, to use HCE? Guys with a fruit-sounding name? And I don't mean BlackBerry? Why not? Why not? The embedded secure element used by Apple today is upsetting everybody, actually. The banks are frightened. The credit card companies aren't because they get a pitch. They get a, they get a, they get a, they're in the, in the ball game the credit card companies. The banks are almost left out. Many of them are left out. Or they, if they don't play by Apple's rules, they're left out. HC in an, in, a, in an Apple phone makes sense because all the other companies that tried to implement the embedded secure element failed. Who tried? Nokia. They were the first ones to try with the embedded secure element. They failed. Who came next? Who came next was Samsung. They failed. Blackberry. They failed. And finally, Google. They failed to use the embedded secure element because that takes control away from the MNO and the bank. Puts the control only into the handset vendors. Um, the control of the embedded secure element, the only winner is the handset vendor. And Apple has been able to get away with doing that right now. 
Now, um, quite honestly, I think that Apple will realize that if they want the entire spectrum of users and merchants to work with, they will implement a hybrid phone too, like Microsoft will, like Google has done, like BlackBerry has done. I think it'll become a reality. So that's the end of my presentation, which is, ladies and gentlemen, expect a hybrid smartphone using the secure element from a SIM card and this HC technology evolving in the same handset. So that is my presentation, uh, and I'll take questions now. Thank you. I know it's, very, I know it's a little complicated, but um, I'll take questions and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Oh, you probably have some of your own. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, coming tonight, and uh, sorry about the traffic and stuff. But, well, uh, I, I'm sorry that I came late, and I'm sorry that um, uh, we couldn't really show the video too much, but... Um, well, I think we have the room in, um, until about, you know, about I, half an hour, if you... What I, I, what I think we'll do is we should sh uh, continue showing that HC video, because everything I talked about tonight, I've got uh, a full video of about 9 or 11 minutes, uh, something like that, which uh, shows most of these companies talking about the technology. So we can do that, but I can also answer some questions. I, I, I'd be yeah. happy to do that. Questions? Talk a little bit about TEE. Yes. Question about TEE. Yes. So I was the victim for Jamalto's sister company called Trusted Logic from starting from early 2010 to take this technology and first pitch it for the protection of um, streaming video content. So content protection. Um, basically, uh, Arm and uh, Trusted Logic positioned this to Hollywood around 2008 to lobby Hollywood that their videos were being ripped off all over the world, including China, okay? Um, and what they said is, if you implemented this technology into the smartphones, the tablets, the smart TVs, and the set-top boxes, if you implemented this technology embedded into ARM's trust zone in a mobile apps processor chip, because all these devices use mobile apps processors, you would be able to to provide the protection because you take the DRM, which is nothing but software, and you put it into Trust Zone in a firewall environment in the chip, hackers can't get to it. So I was promoting that technology from 2010 until 2013. That was the first use case for the trusted execution environment, which was invented by a company called Trusted Logic. Jamalto bought this company in late 2009. They, they made me, as the NFC guy in China, they made me the, TT, the TEE guy as well. And I basically um, started promoting this to smartphone, tablet vendors, but eventually also to smart TV vendors and set-top box guys. That was the first use case. Then they wanted to migrate the use case to the protection of mobile wallet PIN codes, where you simply take the payment credentials, not put it in the SIM, not put it in the micro SD, not embed it into a standalone NFC controller chip, but actually embed it into the TEE which could then go into the cloud and come back from the cloud and stay there. And only you, if you paid for it, would have the keys to send it to the post device. So it's another way to store, another place to store the credentials, the payment credentials, inside the smartphone. It's a logical situation because ARM, ARM knows. And, and by the way, you should all probably know this with Mr. Edward Snowden and the NSA and the Chinese hacking and the Russian hacking. These devices have no security. Zero. Zero right now. S people can be listening and watching me 24 hours a day, and you don't know it because when you download an application, these, I'm sorry, you engineers, you should know better than to not tell the world that these applications are not secure. You can't secure the, you're laughing, you know the truth. These applications cannot be secured. Hackers can get to them. They can take your fantastic application, embed secret code, send it back up on the same website that it was downloaded from, and bingo, you have malware, and you have Trojans embedded, you have man-in-the-middle attacks, you have all these things that could happen because you don't have point-to-point -point encryption. You don't have security from the device to the post terminal. In between, you have security breaches all along the way, and if you put anything in the open operating system smartphone, I don't care if it's from Google, if from Microsoft, even Apple, although, I'll tell you a secret, Apple is using Trust Zone. So Apple's working with ARM, they just don't want the public to know about that. Because, well, they, they just do secret things. The TEE secures the data, it's not 
but it's about 90, I don't know, 98% secure, just like the secure element. But the real key is it also requires somebody to control something, right? The HCE um, also actually requires, there's no way to avoid somebody controlling your payment credentials. There's just no way. Otherwise, you have no security at all. But the T is another way to store the payment credentials. That's what it is. It's just another way to do that. And the two major use cases were protection of high definition video content and protection of the mobile wallet PIN code or the payment credentials for the mobile wallet and the mobile wallet PIN code. So I was promoting that technology to China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan for three plus years until I returned to the United States. So I believe HC and the TE will have a, a place to play in the future of an open operating system smartphone. And I think Apple is looking at all these technologies now. Uh, I, I think the embedded secure element is something that may not prove successful um, down the road for Apple. But right now, it seems to work. I, I question that. I question that from my years of experience watching all the other handset vendors who had probably just as equally interesting business models for the embedded secure element also fail. That, that's, so that's basically what the trusted execution environment. It is owned by three companies now. It is owned by Arm, 40% share. Jamalto and G&D, which is another smart card company. There are three major smart card companies in the world today. Jamalto, G&D, which is a German name. I can never say it. Gesent, um, Deferent and Gesent. Can you say the word? I can never say it. Yeah, you might be the only one who can say that. I've talked to many people in the company. They can't even say it. Uh, and then, of course, Obertour, which is the third company. One's a German company. The other two are French. So as I say to you, this whole mobile payment technology is coming from the French, the Germans, and the Dutch. NXP is a spin out from Philips. This technology is a three-way JV, oh, is it, sorry, it was a three-way development between Philips, Sony, and Nokia. But Nokia played a much less, much less of a role than Philips and Sony with the development of NFC technology uh, out, of, um, out of France and Holland, uh, actually in around year 2000 or 2001. Uh, and those engineers who formed this technology spun out from the company formerly known as Gem Plus, which became Gemalto. So the French, the Dutch, and the Germans are all playing a hand in all of these mobile payment, secure, smart card, and EMV. It's, it's a European technology. That's why we Americans are laggards, because we don't know the technology. It's coming from the Europeans. And we have a mindset sometimes, which is if it's not Silicon Valley invented, we don't care. And that's the wrong attitude. I hope I answered your question. And question. Yes. So, so from a developer's actually got this. It's from a switching. Yes, simply tap will give you an SDK if you if you ask them I can help you if you want. Yeah, so that's actually my question. So, yes. We uh, can chat about that. What is it for though? Can you tell us or um, it's a secret? Well, let's put it this way, just for personal enhancement. I got it. Okay? So why don't we chat after um, but absolutely, Simply Tap will supply you an SDK to play with, or if you want to pay, get more, more support, pay a few bucks and you can get the, ac the actual application. My friends, this is going away. You don't need this. This is going away. Well, that's what PayPal used, right? Well, if PayPal doesn't use NFC, PayPal will go away. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, that's the, I mean... I have no patience with people who tell me that this stuff is, is the future. I know it's not. That's the veto, it's exactly, but this, how this works is it uses a mag strip. I mean, the whole mag strip technology is going away. Now, now, I advise companies in China to take the NFC controller chip, put it here, attach it to smartphones that do not have NFC, Ooh, then you have a viable option. If you add NFC to a device and somehow provide security, uh, PCI DSS, somehow provide security with NFC so that now you can just, you can still use Magstrip. It's not going to be dead, but then you can use the NFC for a smartphone, a lot of 3G and 4G smartphones that don't have NFC. So this has value in certain markets, mostly 3G, mar mostly 3G markets, developing country markets. Still has value, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't work for this kind of company. I don't, I don't see the logic except for developing country markets that have a huge 3G base without NFC. And that 
is where? Well, all of Asia has NFC implemented from Japan all the way down to Indonesia uh, because of Jamalto and some other companies. Europe, NFC everywhere. Um, African continent, yes. Middle East, possibly. Australia, maybe, but it's a big country with not many people. Um, where else? Mexico, South America, possibly. Apple is going to make sure that we'll be an NFC enabled country. Thank the Lord. <laughs> That's all I can say. I hope I answered your question, uh, and we can talk a little bit later at that. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple things. First of all, that one of the problems that you're pointing out, PCI DSS on a little device that actually attached to the phone outside is going to be difficult to get Very difficult. certification for. Um, Very difficult. From a ter terminal provider's perspective, uh, what is required to accept NFC payments? And uh, because I understand the certification process is made for, is it made for a Visa, for MasterCard, for America Express, for Apple Pay, for every single one of the uh, EMV. people on the other side? Or is it uh, universal and you have to pay for it once? Actually. EMV is needed for the credit card, the post terminal, and the handset. Actually, all three need certification for EMV. Except in China, where they have a different protocol, and Japan. But in China, they're using PBOC, People's Bank of China, 2.0 version. Or maybe now it's a 3.0. But when it comes to the reader itself, you mentioned the post reader. It needs to be. It needs to be EMV, PCI, DSS compliant. But the card. The cards need that, and so does the handset. That's what I meant by point-to-point -point encryption. Everything right, no, no, I'm sorry, and I might have said EMV, and I'm sorry, actually, the EMV is another the question. The NFC is what oh, I'm talking about for yes. NFC payments. Yes. Certification for every single one of the receivers, or is it just uh, you get certified NFC, and then that's it? No, so I think So from a terminal a, provider. Yeah, well, first of all, you can't really implement that on a, on a post-terminal unless you join the, the NFC forum. So you have to be a member of the NFC forum. You have to join that organization. Uh, the top, as you know, the top post vendors in the world today are Ingenico, Verifone, um, and a bunch of Chinese and Korean vendors. And I've also, there's a company in North America that still makes uh, post devices, and they've added NFC, MagTech. Yeah, um, um, yeah MagTech is not, yeah. They're, they're not doing too well yet on NFC. They're starting to for, for do that. But we're actually providing a new, new POS terminal. Uh, for pay at the table for restaurants and is using NFC as well. Is it mobile or is is it's a it's, it's a, a mobile, mobile? It's a mobile device. And we're going through PCI Does it have DSS the ability, now. Okay, I I spent some time consulting for a company in California. So it's an is it an all-in-one device that you use in your hand? It is. Does it have a printer? It doesn't. You see, the problem there is that very often when you're in a restaurant and you give the person your email address and you walk out thinking, hey, they got it right. Not all the time. No, that's, that's, we have double checks for that as well. But we, we should talk about it afterwards, I would like to. But the question, though, is the NFC certification, do we have to certify for every single card vendor as well as every single payment type? Because those are yes, $50,000, $100,000 per. I'm sorry, but you do. Yeah, OK. Um, and I'm sorry to say that this is not going to be an easy process. But it is a process that will put you ahead of the ball game if you do it now. Right. Don't wait like Target to realize that you don't have proper security. No, we're because building. Be, we're building it. We're building it from day one. We have security all the way through. We encrypt. We use SRED and we encrypt the moment that it's pl placed onto the device, or actually through the card reader, uh, or through the EMV uh, terminal as well. Yep. I, I wish you the best of luck. I think that this is a great business to jump into. Um, it simply is. It simply is. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, hey, uh, I know you, uh, young man. Hey, this you want This is Omar Lee, by the way. This this fellow has been in the state for I'm out, 20, 25 years. And he is the guy who started the Great Wall uh, shopping mall. Hands off to him. Let's give him a, it's not an easy thing to do. OK, he put a miniature Great Wall looking building in Kent, Renton, Renton. Uh, Kent. And my hat's off to you always, Omar. Hey, uh, Carl, can you tell us a little bit you know, you just come back from China out this Spain. Well, I didn't just come back. I've been back a year, but okay. I'm constantly talking to yeah. everybody in China. About For this. Um, almost five years, uh, most five of years. the Chinese uh, handset manufacturer, are they adopting, because most of them use different versions of, uh, you know, Android, 
Uh, are they uh, using NFC or HC that you're talking about, whether Xiaomi not H, or not Huawei H or, or some of those uh, TSC? No, yes, no. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Nobody is using HC right now. Um, I am talking to companies about helping them do that. Nobody's using HC right now. China Union Pay is working with China Mobile, Unicom, and Telecom, the operators, to provide the SIM card with the secure element uh, in the SIM card, just like here in North America. Should be the same technology and protocol. Should be interoperable, uh, except that it's not using the same EMV standard. It's using something called PBOC, because China Union Pay controls the banks, controls the payment protocol in China, not the operators. See, the banks have more power in China than the operators. In America, the operators have lots more power than the banks. I don't know, you might agree or not agree with me. But um, in China, there's, they have their own protocol. Um, and they issue credit cards and issue mobile payment smartphones with NFC technology, but they're not using EMV <coughs> inside the country. Now, they will use EMV outside the country, and they will cooperate with handset manufacturers like ZT, Huawei, Lenovo, and maybe foreign companies like HC. Technically, a Taiwanese company is a foreign company in China, technically. I don't want to get into the politics of Taiwan and China. Anyway, the bottom line is the bottom line. They, Union Pay wants to go outside of China with NFC technology, and they may use HC. China Mobile, Unicom, Telecom don't have that direct plan right now because they really have a tough time. They would have a tough time doing that because they don't have a payment platform outside of China. Union, China Union Pay has ambitions. They're very smart. They want to work with the handset vendors. They want to work with the operators. And of course, they own and control the banks. So the, the interesting thing is Alibay, Alibaba, Alipay wants to come to the United States and they want to pitch payment, right? Proximity payment. But China Union Pay wants to do the same thing. Now, the, the rumor is, is that China Union Pay tried to buy Discover Card uh, a while ago. And uh, I guess the US government said, no, you're not buying a US credit card company. The US market is fertile. It's open. And that's why the Chinese companies want to come here. Because there are lots of Chinese people traveling all over the world who have lots and lots of money. And they buy lots of things outside China. Because as you know, things inside China are very expensive. Uh, and you don't even know if it's real or if it's a knockoff. So when Chinese people leave China and go outside, my goodness, they spend more money than anybody else uh, as tourists. And they, they keep companies, they, they keep, um, they keep um, universities installed by sending students there. They keep companies and businesses flowing by the money that, they, that transfer outside of China every single day. Do not under, uh, underestimate the power of the Chinese dollar, I mean the Chinese consumer with their dollars, whether it be US, US money or RMB. It's really important to understand that. That is a huge opportunity for you guys, if you're going to develop a wallet, to not forget the importance of the Chinese market. The Indian market will come, but the Indian market is not as sophisticated at this, at this point in time as the Chinese market is. But it will, it will evolve, because I see interesting things going on in India right now. Hopefully I answered that question. So handset vendors will use the technology. They're already using the regular SIM card because they want to sell the handsets to the operators. It's a mindset change for these guys to talk to a bank. I introduced HTC to China Merchants Bank, Zhao Shang Inhang, in 2010. And they said, Carl, are you crazy? No, I'm not crazy. Because China Merchants Bank invited me as one of Jamalto's customers to visit them in 2010. They said, Carl, we like this security, uh, but we, we don't know any of these handset vendors. Can you help us? So I introduced them to HTC, because HTC had the technology back in 2010. Then HTC worked with China Union Pay. So you see, the, these, guys, these, these guys have a difficult time working with banks. I don't know. You might agree with that, Aaron. They really have a tough time, because they're not used to dealing with banks. And banks also have a tough time dealing with handset vendors. Looks like Carl to the rescue again, maybe. We'll see. So that's, that's my mantra right now, which is to take the HCE technology to the site of the handset manufacturing ecosystem in Taiwan and China and develop many types of wallets that adopt HCE, but also provision and provide for the regular SIM card, because that business is not going away, but the, the future is a hybrid phone. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Security is not a problem for tokenization, but security on an open operating system is always going to be a problem because hackers, I'm sorry, they're very sophisticated and their tools, their tools are better than the MNOs. I'm sorry, can I say that? Hackers are so sophisticated because they're driven by underworld elements around the world. It isn't just China, it isn't just Russia. Uh, if you've ever seen a Hollywood movie, there's always a, a, a wise ass hacker who can get into any surveillance system, right? By the way, Hollywood often imitates reality. So security is always going to be a problem on a mobile device, but the way Apple has implemented this technology and the way tokens work, I believe, and of course the TEE, I believe the risks have been very much minimized now. And thank goodness that we do have this technology now on a smartphone. It just depends on how much it costs to get the security in because nobody wants to pay for security unless they have a breach, like Target. I don't know. <laughs> I, you, you don't have to agree with anything I say, but you can just say, Carl, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm, ha I'm happy to debate. Um, please, continue. Yeah, I'm not sure how these tokens are implemented, but uh, in general, the security tokens are just uh, uh, a unique way function you can it's like a hash it's a um, sequence of characters which cannot be reversed uh, th th does but the some of the, the passwords are I've smart. been told four of the original credit card numbers still remain uh, to identify but there are some secrets that right, right. that credit and card companies it, it, nor Apple want us to know that's a fact and of right. course they don't want the hackers to know yeah, as an additional feature to the tokens they are valid usually for 15 minutes or less so <clears throat> even if you have the most sophisticated uh, hardware you practically cannot uh, even if you manage to decrypt it uh, somehow to reverse the function and come to the original card number it's going to be way before it before uh, way after it expired i mean the token won't be valid anymore if if i if i may if you want to get more information on that look up duck put uh in wikipedia or anywhere else d u c k p t and that's what controls a lot of the uh, uh s red and tokenization they also use a different token for every single scan or for every single encryption. So even if you get one of them, you get one transaction. And you, and, and you have to do it within the time allotted to. So it's going to be very difficult to do. This technology simply puts a dent in the hacker's ability to, to steal your payment credentials. And it's about time because um, <clears throat> the security of these devices has been in question. So thank goodness that the awareness of these technologies um, is coming to the forefront. And thank goodness that, I don't know why, but we had to wait for Apple to implement it. I don't understand that. But it's maybe because Apple is a game changer. And they're, they're, a, they're a society changer, they're an industry changer, and they're a game changer uh, in the technology space. And um, as you notice, I'm using BlackBerry. BlackBerry also has very good security, although people laugh at me when I tell them I like using this. <laughs> um, any other questions? I'd be very, yes, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend, um, Xinhua would like to come up and um, tell you about her interesting new book. She came out with a book called uh, NFC Define or NFC Explained, and she's got a 2.0 version. I think she's added me. She said something about me in her new book. I think. Yeah. Uh, Take I it away. Just released my second edition of Everyday NFC Near Field Communication Explained. So Carl gave you a lot of information. This book actually in plain English explains all the fundamentals. And here is a chip here. So if you uh, tap this uh, NFC tag, you will get into my Amazon page, Arthur's page. And I have three books to give away today. And uh, uh, Oh, look at that. There we go. Took a little bit of pressing, but it brings me to your page. I had to hand a uh, correct couple of the mistakes here in the book because this was released uh, 10 days ago. So after I got the Apple Pay, um, I released my book again. But for the one I have, I have to hand correct it. So uh, for Carl talking about the hybrid phone with hybrid wallet, I respectfully disagree. <gasps> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, We're because. When I use Apple Pay, it's just surprisingly easy 
the good user experience, I think, will really be a game changer. Um, I used the soft cars from the very beginning, and people just don't know about it. But even now, they, after six months, they claim they have 20,000 people signed up every day. So they start to pick up, people start to pick up the knowledge and started to use it. But you have to go in to, oh, I have my Android devices is there. So you have to go in to pick up the app, soft car. Then you have to type in your pins. And then you have to scroll down and then to pay. For Apple Pay, it's, it's a Touch ID integrated with in-app uh, passbook. So all you need to do is you loaded your credit card in the passbook. The first one you loaded is your default card. And uh, you, reach your, you reach your iPhone to any terminals, NFC enabled terminals, and put your touch ID here. And then it will just pay. It's very um, seamless user experience. I think just because of that, it's going to really um, promote the NFC technology. Would you like to um, give one of these books away by... by yeah, I, I have three books. I can't but, give it away. But, but do you have a, a question um, that you want to ask the crowd to, you know, let's make this a little interesting. And Aaron can join too, right? So. Okay. Well, what, well, why don't you, I won't, I, I don't, you Okay, gave me so, one, so uh, I, I have a question since Carl gave you so much information. So there are three different kind of NFC mobile payment, major three different kinds. Who knows uh, which three is that? Oh, you mean the modes? Oh, yes. Okay. Who's got the answer? Okay, single tap is for HCE, and what are two other kind? Anybody want to hazard a guess? With soft card, what technology we use for? Secure element, Secure element where? On the chip, on the SIM card. And then what's the third kind? That's what Apple used. Embedded. So what I heard embedded is embedded in the jacket here. That's why you can't use uh, there you go. aluminum. You got your one, two, three yeah, I got right my there. Three. three part answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, right. Is there anything else you want to say about your book and about your, 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 you know, what, your, what your plans are next? Um, you work for at and is that right? I used to. Uh -huh. Okay, good, because we might have to kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> when I worked for AT&T, I was on uh, NFC project, and then I quit AT&T. Um, when I tried to ramp up my own consulting company, I started to write this book. I have a lot of passion towards NFC technology. I think it really helps marketing, and uh, to the end, I think it really helped the big data scenario. So when we have started to collect data from all of the NFC tabs, we can create a lot of opportunity for businesses, also for, to help people out for emergency situation or for, um, for anything, um, you know, big data can come up with a, a case for. Uh, there are many applications for NFC that we simply haven't seen yet. If you go to Europe and to France especially, uh, and even in Asia, the J Japan, South Korea, you'll see many applications you never imagined that are going on there that they're using. It's, it's just, it's truly, uh, it's truly amazing the difference between how little we do here and, and how much is going on in some European and Asian countries. It's just amazing. Yes, yeah, when Coca-Cola started to use soft car, they, they did a promotion and they actually collect data. It, one is by NFC, another one is by QR code. And through NFC, they can figure it out what devices you use and what OS model you use and what uh, the frequency versus QR code. So they can do analysis and then meet their customers' needs much better in that way. And for developers, NFC form, they just started a developer program and it's called uh, tapintonfc.org. So that's a brand new program. If you are interested, check that out. They also started a page just for product showcase, which actually was my business idea, but they already started to do it. Get so, some back royalties from AT&T. Yeah, so I have a, a, a website called Everyday NFC. If you follow me with my name, then Xuan Hua Qian, then you can get most of the NFC news. Oh, there's, other, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. 
and I, I should have done this, and this has caused some of the confusion with tonight and our participation. I actually have my own meetup group called NFC Payments and Security, um, but you know, I, I felt that um, it would be better to uh, work with Aaron and the T-Mobile meetup group because they're an operator. This technology is, is being proliferated by one of their partners, the SoftCard. So I felt I, I have a meetup group, and I will be inviting maybe Xunhua again and any other people who are interested to talk about their NFC payment or security technologies. If you have technologies, you need to see me because I will give you the venue uh, and the opportunity to speak and present because I normally go to, I normally have a connection with the NITEC Kirkland Innovation Center. They usually give me a venue to, uh, and I usually bring my, my, my Costco pizza there as well. And we usually have an interesting discussion. So, you know, evangelization is not easy, but I, I wanted to, I want to thank Aaron for, it took me a while to get to convince him to let me speak here, but thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance yeah. to talk about the technology. Thank you, Carl. You, thank you. I, I'm, I very much appreciate it. Now, everybody, um, this technology is coming. You, it's not, there's nothing that's going to slow it down or stop it since Apple is in it. So what I suggest is if you're going to buy an iPhone, you're going to eventually be using this technology. So the more that you know about it, uh, the better, and hopefully, this, um, this can be videotaped and put up on, on the T-Mobile um, Meetup Group website so that everybody can uh, understand more about these technologies. Um, so I, I hope everybody has had a, um, at least a little bit better understanding. I know it's complicated and I know it's technical, uh, but I try to evangelize it the best I can for the layman's terms. So uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, we still, I don't know, I guess we should be out of here soon, but right. thank, you, thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming out. Appreciate it. Hope we all learned a lot. Uh, just to let everyone know, remember uh, next month we have um, our um, chat with uh, the CEO of Siren coming in, and then uh, the following month we'll, Amazon will come out and talk to us about AWS. So thank you very much. And don't be surprised if they mention something about HCE. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.